Welcome to First Christian Reformed Church of Montreal. This is the online version of our worship service for Sunday, January 10, 2021. If you're joining us for the first time, thank you for being with us. If you'd like to find out more about us at First CRC, you can check out our website at www.montrealcrc.org. You can also visit us on Facebook. We begin our worship together with a prayer. Fill our worship with grace, Lord Jesus Christ, that every thought, word, and deed may be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. God himself calls us to worship with these words taken from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. God himself greets us with these words, first spoken through the prophet Isaiah. You whom I took from the ends of the earth, and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Amen. We have a couple of suggested songs to share with you. Blessed be your name and in Christ alone. If you look in the description below this video, you'll find links to other YouTube videos that include words and music for each of these songs. You can also follow along if you have the Lift Up Your Hearts hymn book. We're starting a new three-part sermon series this Sunday based on a sermon series first done by Pastor Andy Stanley from North Point Ministries in Atlanta, Georgia. This series is called, He Still Got the Whole World in His Hands. We begin this week looking at Mark chapter 14, verses 17 to 31. Before we read these words together, let's again come before God in prayer. Lord God, help us turn our hearts to you and hear what you will speak. For you speak peace to your people through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mark chapter 14, starting at verse 17. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, Even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, 
I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, there's this one song they often teach kids in Sunday school. It's probably familiar to many of you. It goes like this. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Now, it's a great little song. Maybe it's better if I'm not the one singing it, but it's a great little song, especially because it teaches a very basic truth that no matter what happens, God is always there. He knows what's going on. He's big enough to take care of it all. It's a great little song, except there are times when it can really be tough to believe that. Like this past week, especially this past Wednesday, we were already expecting another announcement from our Premier here in Quebec about the pandemic. The restrictions that they had put in place at Christmas weren't really helping to get the numbers of new infections going in the right direction. So most of us, we already knew that they needed to do something. But there's still no guarantee, there's no certainty that things will be going in the right direction when the new set of COVID-19 regulations are supposed to end four weeks from now. So, we were already expecting that, another announcement about the pandemic, at least here in Quebec. But then that same day, we started getting the news from the U.S. about protesters, rioters, storming the U.S. Capitol building. Again, most of us, we kind of knew things down in the States were not entirely settled, not since the election back in November. There was still a lot of talk about challenging the election results, but still, I don't think anyone expected what happened in Washington, D.C. this past week. When things like that happen, it can be a real challenge to believe that God is really there and that he's really got things under control. We may still want to believe that song that he's got the whole world in his hands, but experience tends to strongly suggest that the only thing we can be certain of is uncertainty. And especially right now, I think it's pretty safe to say that we are living in the midst of some very uncertain times. But then, in Mark's account of the Last Supper, we're given this reminder that a lot of the key moments in the Bible, a lot of its core truths, get unfolded and get unpacked in what were also very uncertain times. Even the way that Mark organizes his material here in Mark 14, it emphasizes that point, that overwhelming sense of uncertainty. The way that Mark puts this particular story together, it's been described like a sandwich. We first get Jesus announcing that he's going to be betrayed. And then later on, starting in verse 27, Jesus tells his disciples that they'll all fall away, that they will all fail him. But then between those two sections, between those two chunks in the narrative, you get the heart, the meat of the story. Jesus breaks bread. He shares the cup. He gives his followers this supper that's going to help them make sense of it all. Pastor Andy Stanley from North Point Ministries, which is where I got the idea for this sermon and the rest of the sermons in this series, he really emphasizes what a confusing, disorienting experience all this would have been for Jesus' followers, especially for his 12 closest disciples. They'd been with Jesus for three years now. They had heard his message about the coming of God's kingdom. They had seen what Jesus could do, his power. 
And while the twelve would have known that not everyone believed in Jesus, he was often at odds with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The twelve knew that, that not everyone believed in him. But they did. Just a few days earlier, they had been there when Jesus had rode into Jerusalem in triumph. And the timing seemed significant. It was just a few days before the Passover, before the celebration of how God had delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. To them, to the disciples, it would have looked like God was on the verge of bringing about another great deliverance. But then, in the middle of the feast, in the middle of their celebration of the Passover, Jesus drops this bombshell. One of you, one of you eating with me, one of you eating my food and sharing my hospitality, one of you taking part in this celebration that I planned, one of you is going to betray me. Now, the disciples probably already had a sense that things weren't going as planned. Rather than enter Jerusalem and triumph once again, this time, this time they had snuck into the city after dark. And Jesus had even kept the location of the upper room where they were eating a secret from them until the last minute. It was as if he knew that one of them could not be trusted. But still... What Jesus says, it must have seemed to come from totally out of the blue, at least for 11 of the disciples. One of us? What do you mean, one of us is going to betray you? I'm sure that at this point, all of them were in a panic. Okay, think back, think back. Was my hand in that bowl at the exact same time as Jesus? They seem to honestly have no idea how to respond to this. It couldn't be me, could it? Could it be me? How do I know that I can even trust myself? How? But then, what Jesus says after the meal, as he and the disciples are making their way over the, to the Mount of Olives, that just reinforces this deep sense of uncertainty, this sense that we can't even trust ourselves. Again, seemingly out of the blue, Jesus says to his disciples, You will all fall away. Every last one of you, you will abandon me. You will become untrue. Of course, Peter right away protests. All the rest of them, they might. But me, I will never abandon you. And the rest, realizing that Peter has just insulted them, they all chime in. Hey, we would never do that either. We would never Turn our back on you. Not you, Jesus. But deep down, deep down it's hard to deny the truth of what Jesus says. Yes, you will leave me. You will abandon me because once the shepherd is struck down, what do you think is going to happen to the sheep? Because on your own, without me, your life has no center, no focal point, nothing that really holds it all together. Even Peter's boasting, it just shows how the group that had gathered around Jesus had already started to fragment and to falter. The way that Mark presents what happened to Jesus' disciples that last evening before his arrest and crucifixion the way that it didn't take all that much for them to lose their confidence, to lose their sense of certainty. It's kind of scary, especially because it is so true to life. The reality is that it doesn't take much for us either to lose our own sense of certainty. It doesn't take much for us to feel like things are spinning out of all control, even God's control. And at least part of the reason for that is that's how we are wired. 
Most of us that way, we're a little bit like ships out on the ocean. We, we need a fixed point. We need a north star to give our life a sense of direction, a, a sense of meaning. And that fixed point, it, it could be a relationship. We come to rely on our spouse or a parent or a close friend, someone who is always there for us. That fixed point, it could be a goal we've set for ourselves. We tell ourselves, by this time next year, I'm going to get myself out of debt. I'm going to get married. I'm going to graduate and start my career. That fixed point, it could even be a key part of how we see ourselves, uh, our sense of who we are. You know that the one thing about me you can count on, it's my integrity. It's my intelligence. It's my dogged determination, etc., etc. Now, like I said, just about all of us, we have this central thing, this fixed point that we rely on to give our life a sense of meaning and direction. And quite a lot of the time, it's something that we choose. It's something we pick. We like to define what that central something in our lives is. But as Jesus himself shows us in the story of what happened to his closest followers this night before his arrest, it doesn't take much to pull all of that down and, and send it crashing to the ground. Like in the parable of the wise and foolish builders, when life storms hit, it doesn't take long to find out that what we thought was solid ground is really just sinking sand. And so the challenge that Jesus gives us in Mark 14, Jesus challenges us to let him be that fixed point, to let him be that one certain thing that we can count on when everything else seems to be crumbling. Jesus challenges us, as he does again and again throughout the Bible, to entrust ourselves to him, to put it all in his hands. But that's not all that Jesus does. He also gives this assurance, this promise in the form of a simple meal. Sandwiched between his sudden announcement that one of the twelve would betray him and that later announcement that the rest would all fall away. Mark tells us about how Jesus took some bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He takes some of that same bread that they'd all been eating earlier, including the one who would betray him. Jesus takes that bread and breaks it and he proceeds to give some of it to each of them. And he then says, take it. This is my body. And then later on, after they had eaten the Passover meal, after they had eaten the lamb and the bitter herbs, Jesus takes the cup. He again gives thanks. He shares it with all of them even though he already knows that they are all going to fail him and fall away. He shares the cup with all of them, and they all drink from it. And he says to them, This is my blood, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Jesus, he takes elements from the old, from the Passover celebration, which for centuries had reminded God's people of how he had delivered them. And Jesus infuses these elements with new meaning, with a fuller sense of God's purpose. The bread given to each of them, that bread becomes a perpetual witness of Jesus' very real presence among them. This is my body. This bread it is a sign that I am really with you. From now on, whenever you eat it, know that I will never leave or forsake you, no matter what. 
and this cup, this wine, this fruit of the vine, this is my blood. It points to my life, which I am giving so that your sins can be forgiven, so that you can be saved. From now on, this cup is going to be a witness testifying to the truth that no, no other sacrifice can save, no other blood will do. But not only that, this cup, it's going to be a reminder that, that you are no longer your own. You no longer live, but I live in and through you. Before, under the old covenant, the covenant that God made with his people when they left Egypt, the blood that pointed to God's salvation, it was smeared on the doorposts at Sinai, that blood was poured out and sprinkled on the altar and upon the people. But that's not what God was really after. He was after much more than just that. What he's always wanted was for us to experience him living in and through us. What God has always wanted was for us to have true life, real life, the kind of life that only he can give. The kind of life that becomes ours when we put our trust in life and in death in his son. What happens that evening in that upper room? In a sense, it's nothing new. You read through the rest of the Bible and you'll find there too all kinds of stories about people in times of crisis. People not sure at all about what to do, about what's next. People up to their eyeballs in uncertainty. As Andy Stanley points out, the Bible doesn't really give us much in the way of feel-good messages for a world we don't live in. Rather, what the Bible gives us is a very realistic picture of how God has this way of coming to us, and especially when we're struggling most to figure out what's going on, helping us to see how he is still there, how he is still at work in this world and in our own lives. I know that for myself, I've been struggling at least a little bit lately with uncertainty. We are now into month 10 of the pandemic. And it's hard with so much uncertainty swirling around us not to wonder, well, what's going to happen to our church here in Montreal? And when you read about what's going on in our denomination, it's hard not to wonder where is the Christian Reformed Church headed? And in my own personal life, I've got kids who are trying to figure out college and high school and driver's ed and braces, again, all during a pandemic. And as I've shared in the past few weeks with our church family, we've been praying a lot for my brother and sister-in-law after their three-year-old son was just diagnosed with cancer. There is a lot in life that is just plain uncertain. I appreciated a story that Pastor Stanley shared about another pastor he had met, Reverend Otis Moss, Jr. When Stanley first met him, Reverend Moss was already in his 70s. He'd been born in 1935 to an African-American family from rural Georgia. He'd lost both of his parents by the time he was 16. He grew up and experienced firsthand the worst of what America had to offer. But somehow, God found him in the midst of all that. Otis Moss became a believer and then a pastor. He became friends with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and, and even marched with him. And now Reverend Moss was about to meet then-President Barack Obama. For Reverend Moss, this moment was a long time coming. As they waited for their turn to shake hands with the President, Reverend Moss turned to Pastor Stanley and said to him, Pastor Stanley, 
And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. But then his voice broke off. Pastor Stanley had to finish the verse for him, and who have been called according to his purpose. Reverend Moss, regaining his voice, then added, That's right. But sometimes it takes him a while. Sometimes, sometimes it does seem that it takes God a while. Sometimes it can be really hard for us to see what is God doing. Where is he going? But we have Jesus' own promise to us. He is still with us even now. He still got the whole world in his hands. Amen. Let's take a few moments to reflect on what that means. That God still has the whole world in his hands. Our world is broken. People search for meaning and purpose in many things. They live their lives, but they don't know grace, hope, love. But God sent Jesus. He saved us. He heals us and gives us hope. His grace is for everyone. This is our mission to come together as a church and proclaim the good news of God's grace, to reach those who are lost and build God's kingdom on earth, to call everyone to know and follow Christ, to deepen faith, strengthen mission, and amplify the gospel in our neighborhoods and across the world. Jesus meets people wherever they are, and so do we. Wherever the Holy Spirit leads, we follow. We're in schools and on university campuses. We're in churches and communities in your neighborhood and across the world. We partner and collaborate to reach more people in more places. Because we join hands and work together, we can go further than we ever could alone. Together, we introduce people to Christ. We disciple believers, train pastors, invite neighbors, equip leaders, guide teachers, plant churches. Resonate is an extension of your church. We want to help congregations discover where God is moving and join Him on mission. The gospel echoes out. People are meeting Jesus. The Holy Spirit is changing lives and believers are transforming communities throughout the world. God's mission isn't finished. It belongs to each one of us, each person, each church, each community. Join with us and learn how you and your church can deepen, strengthen, and amplify your place in the mission of God. Together, we can bring the name of Jesus into every corner of the world. Let's resonate with God's mission. Let's again take a few moments to bow our heads and hearts before God in prayer. 
Lord God, Father in heaven, for a lot of us, the past week has been extremely difficult, filled with uncertainty. We did know that there were going to be more restrictions to try and help contain the spread of COVID-19. We know that these measures are needed. We don't want to see anyone else get sick. We don't want to see our doctors and nurses getting any more overwhelmed than they already are. But it's still tough, Father. It's hard for so many of us, for our seniors who have already been isolated from family and friends for so long. It's tough for those of us who already struggle with depression or anxiety to have to do without so many of the things like going to the store or the mall or out for a cup of coffee that we've come to rely on to help manage our depression and anxiety. It's hard not knowing if, if these new measures are going to make a difference, and even if they do, at what cost? So we knew about all that, Father. We knew about the new restrictions, but then so many of us, we were caught off guard by the news from the U.S. this past week. And even though we have maybe gotten used to how people have become so divided by political parties and by race and economic status, still it was shocking to see angry mobs storming the U.S. Capitol, confronting law enforcement, trying to intimidate elected officials and sidetrack the democratic process. Father, we lament the violence that we saw. We lament the lives that were lost. We also admit we have no reason to feel superior to anyone. We know that we too, we are also broken, lost people who need you, who need a Savior. And so we pray, not just for those that we know and love, for friends and family members in need of healing, in need of encouragement, in need of comfort. We also pray for our leaders for a renewed commitment to doing what is right and to defending the most vulnerable among us. We pray that hearts on both sides of the political divide would be changed. And we pray for your church, Father. We pray that especially now we would be bold in sharing the good news that there is hope. There is hope because we have a Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Giving is part of our worship. Giving is part of how we show the love of God by reaching out to other people. Now, if you are just joining us online, there's no expectation that you have to give anything. But if you are part of the church family here at First CRC, this is one way that we can give thanks to God and together help in the work of His church. Our offerings this week are for our own ministries here at First CRC and for Resonate Global Mission. Resonate Global Mission partners with churches across the United States and Canada to plant churches, to do campus ministry, to train and equip pastors and to develop future leaders. Resonate also works to send missionaries overseas to proclaim the gospel and to forge lasting partnerships. For more information on how to give, especially if you want to give online, you can contact us by going to our church website or by visiting our Facebook page. God sends us out with his blessing. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Help the suffering. Honor all. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. With God's help, we will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's come to God once more in prayer. Grant, O Lord, that what has been said with our lips, 
we may believe in our hearts, and that what we believe in our hearts we may practice in our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. And again, all God's people said, Amen. As our time together draws to a close, we have two more suggested songs to share with you. Before the throne of God above and the solid rock. Again, if you look in the description below this video, you'll find links to other videos that include the words and music for each of these songs. Until next time, God bless.